Dudes and Dudettes. This is episode 131, 131 of The Anxious Truth. Thanks for coming by. Welcome back to the show and for spending some time with me again. Uh, today we have a guest, and it's a good one. Uh, I have Peter Shankman on. Peter is the creator and host of the Faster Than Normal podcast on iTunes. You can find it at fasterthannormal.com. It's actually the number one trending and ranked uh, ADD, ADHD, neurodiversity podcast in the iTunes catalog today, which is something. Uh, Peter is a super busy guy. Uh, he is a media entrepreneur. He runs a bunch of businesses. He gives keynote speakers around the world. He's a, he's a big dude. He's been on TV. Uh, odds are if you've seen, you know, CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, those type of sh channels, you have seen Peter Shankman on TV. Uh, the man knows he's an expert in what he does. He's also dealt with uh, ADD and ADHD type tendencies and traits throughout most of his life. And he was officially diagnosed in his 30s. And uh, he came on today to tell the story of how that happened, what it meant, and how instead of turning that into a liability or accepting it as a liability, it kind of kicked him into gear to sort of maximize the gifts that his ADHD actually gives him. So in his Amazon bio, it actually says, simply put, Peter always seems to have more than 24 hours a day. How does he do it? Peter attributes his, his unusually high energy level and extreme productivity to his ADHD. So... We talked for about 20 minutes on how he has learned to maximize the positive aspects of his ADHD traits and minimize the ones that could be liabilities and outsource things that he is not good at and have people help him out with things that he might not necessarily be good at so he can excel at the things that his ADHD lets him truly excel at. And he's quite a guy. I think you're going to enjoy hearing from him. Uh, if nothing else, it's a super positive and inspirational story, especially if you are struggling with what your particular diagnosis is. And while ADHD is not necessarily the same as the disorders that we're usually addressing on the podcast, the overall message of always trying to find the silver lining and not allowing yourself to be a victim is a good one. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. I'll see you guys at the end. Peter Shankman, thank you so much for taking the time coming on the podcast. Peter from uh, the Faster Than Normal podcast, the number one ADHD and neurodiversity podcast on iTunes at the moment, which is damn impressive. I know you're a busy guy and I appreciate you taking the time. So welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what I want to talk about is I, I love the way, so Peter and I were introduced by a mutual friend about two weeks ago and um, I'm just digging the message. So what I really want to talk about is how you, uh, I want to talk about your journey into being, you know, understanding that that may have been something not exactly mainstream about the way your brain was working for you. Uh, you uh -huh. just, you were very uh, open and really lighthearted in the way you describe you know, namaste to I'll cut a bitch, which just cracked me the hell up. <laughs> uh, and then the way you kind of have to do things, which is super interesting. And I want to go through like, how did you reach that official diagnosis of ADHD and how you decided to turn it into a positive instead of a potential liability? So yeah, yeah you know, in. growing up, I mean, I was always, I was always a weird kid. I was a kid getting in trouble. And, and, you know, I just figured that's who I was. I never really understood why I never really understood what was causing that. Um, for me, it was, uh, just sort of who I was. And, and over time, I started realizing that the things that were getting me in trouble in school were also the things that could actually, were actually benefiting me. You know, most people don't start companies on airplanes and have them up and running by the time they land. You know, most people don't uh, 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 decide to write a book and then three days later have written a book, you know, at least not without heavy drugs. And, and I realized that I was doing all these things and wasn't really sort of thinking about it or, 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 or trying to figure out why I just was. And, you know, while that was all great, on the flip side, I was spending a lot of my time, you know, uh, unable to hold a relationship or, um, you know, realized that I couldn't work with anyone else. I had to work on my own. I, I couldn't, you know, didn't, didn't play well with others as it were. And I never really put the two together until my early 30s. I started realizing, okay, there's a, you know, there's a correlation here. All the good stuff is great, but all the bad stuff exists as well. How do I sort of get more of the good stuff and get less of the bad stuff? And I finally got diagnosed with ADHD. And by the time I did, I mean, I'd read enough about it to, to sort of know, you know, when you have a, um, when you break your leg and get a bone sticking out of your leg, you, you, you go to get it, not so much to get a diagnosis. Oh, there's a bone sticking on my leg. Yes, there is. You've broken your leg. Well, I pretty much get that. There's the bone. Yeah. You know, rather you go to get help to treat it. You know, they set it, they put it in the cast. It was sort of the same thing with ADHD. I mean, the guy, you know, I, I remember taking this test, this hundred question test, and it's like something like anything more than like 28 questions positive, chances are you have ADHD. I think like 97 positive, right? And I'm like, okay, this is obviously a given. I pretty yeah. much know what's going that, on here. That kind of wasn't but, news to you. you yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but what I realized was that um, I learned that I could put things uh, into play that would create sort of guardrails that would allow me 
to use the best of the stuff that I have and, and sort of uh, depreciate the worst if possible. I, I like that. So over time, now, is this something that you started to think about after that diagnosis or these are just tools that you started gathering and strategies throughout your life, knowing that like, well, I, I have maybe a bit of a weakness here, but a strength here, let me maximize that. Or did that really clarify after that official diagnosis? I think it was a little bit of both. I mean, I think I realized that, okay, this obviously makes sense. You know, now that I know what it is, um, those things that I've been doing to sort of counter the negatives don't really seem that weird anymore. Right. And they make yeah. a lot more sense and they're much more justifiable. Yeah. And so for me, it was, it was sort of like that, like being able to say, okay, this is the reason that I have to work out super, super early. Okay. This is the reason that, you know, my closet has two sides to it and it's labeled office and travel or, 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 you know, speaking in TV and it's, it's, you know, the same outfits on both sides or, you know, same outfit on one side versus the other. Yeah. The key being that you need to be aware of, of what works. Right. And, and so, so, so that was important. Yeah. And, and I like the way that, I mean, you could have, as opposed to approaching this as well, let me organize my life based on what I can't do. It was more so let me organize my life and turn it, you know, maximize the, the assets and minimize liabilities. And so, that's, that's really a key because, you know, you, you don't want to spend time harping on the shit that, 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 that you have a problem with. You want to spend time getting good at the, you know, I don't, I don't do my own accounting because I'm not an accountant. I don't do my own lawyering because I'm not a lawyer. I hire people to do that. I focus on the stuff that I'm really good at that makes me money. And, yeah. and it's going to be the same thing in your personal life. Yeah, that, that makes good sense. And like, you know, we're, we're addressing an audience full of people who are, who are in the process of recovering from anxiety disorders like panic disorder or agoraphobia. And often they start to feel like, well, especially when they get that official diagnosis, like, oh, no, I was just diagnosed with OCD or something. Right. Along those lines. And they feel like it's, uh, I mean, and I guess initially it does feel it's a hit for a lot of people like, oh, no, this is bad. Like, this is the rest of my life. Did you have that? I mean, you already sort of suspected. So it doesn't sound like you took the diagnosis as some sort of like, well, I guess this is just who I am now and I'm going to have to be limited for the next 40 years. I think it was, it was more like, wow, this is who I am now. Cool. Okay. I figured, I figured out what I could do. Right. And, and that to me is, is the excitement part is, okay, I can, you know, what can I do that benefits this? And, and, and that was just exciting as hell to understand that, that there's stuff that I could do um, uh, to, to make my life even better. Right. And, yep. that, and that I could create a great life um, not in, not in spite of, but in collaboration with my ADHD. Right, right, exactly. Now, you know, I think we need to certainly clarify that, you know, those, these neurodiversity issues like ADHD and, and that sort of thing don't necessarily line up exactly with the anxiety disorders that I'm addressing. It's not like, you know, having an anxiety disorder is not necessarily a superpower, but more so the skills that we can learn when we are addressing the disorder and recovering disorder can become lifetime superpowers. Like, so it's a matter of sometimes just taking a look and saying, hey, what am I learning right now? And how can I apply that down the road as opposed to just wearing the label for the rest of your days and deciding, well, this is limits what I can do. So, no yeah, yeah. Let's talk for a second about, and, and I think I heard you say this on one of your earlier podcasts where, uh, or it may have been, I can't remember, I think you said it, if I'm wrong, correct me, but there was that thing that says, well, okay, now you are, you know, diagnosed as, as neurodiverse in some way. There's an ADHD diagnosis. And so many people take that and say, you know what, I'm going to have to, to recover or to overcome this. I have to learn to do things that I'm just not naturally good at because other people are good at them as opposed right. to saying, no, 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 I don't have to do that. I actually don't have to do that. Did, was that something that you ever struggled with? I think for me, you know, again, it came down to knowing what I was good at and figuring out how to maximize that, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if you look back at me in school, I mean, I, I was always amazing at the classes that I loved. Because, why? Because I was, get, I was easily getting the dopamine and I needed to focus on yeah. the stuff I was looking at, right? But give me the stuff I didn't love, I wasn't doing that much, right? Yeah. So, you know, just follow that up. I, I hate math, right? I try to avoid it as much as possible. So it's, it's, those, it's those kind of things, right? So understanding what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have to become good at anything. Rather, I was able to figure out ways to not have to do it. So, you know, for instance, um, being able to, uh, you know, I have an assistant um, who handles my scheduling. I don't have control over my calendar. She took it away from me because I just, I just screwed up. I, yeah. Her breaking point was I scheduled two dinners on the same night on separate continents. And um, <sighs> that's a problem. <laughs> she's like, yeah, you're done. You know, I'm taking this over. And, and that was helpful because, it, you know, you realize that once you can allow someone to take over the stuff you're terrible at, or you figure out a way to outsource the stuff that you're terrible at. It gives you so much more, you, 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 you no longer have the fear because you know you're going to be, you, it's not going to be bad, but also yeah. it gives you a lot more free time to do the stuff that you're good at. 
Yeah, which makes perfect sense. Let, let's talk for that. Like, you interact with a whole lot of people who share your diagnosis or, or identify as neurodivergent in some way. And a lot of super successful people that I think a lot of people would never have known about. You know, talk about a few of those people. And, and by the way, we, while send people to Peter's podcast, faster than normal.com is where you can find the podcast. There's some really good episodes there with some people whose names you're going to know talking about some of these issues. And, you know, how was some of the common threads that you've heard that some of these very successful people have, have they used the same sort of tools that you have? Same type of stories? Not only they have the same type of stories, but, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, there's a great story about Dave Nealman, who was the founder of JetBlue, and how he, um, you know, there was this, always this tree in the backyard uh, of his house that was always dangerously overgrown and, and was going to come crashing down his house any day. And every day, he started off day with, okay, I, I need to call the tree doctor. I got to find a tree doctor. I got to have a tree doctor come and take care of this. And, and every day, he'd say this. And he tells the story, and he just stops. And everyone says, well, did you eventually call the tree? He's like, no, we moved. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, that's one way to do it exactly but 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 again it you know that that's sort of the outlier the, the main story that i normally get from from people like uh tony robbins from seth godin seth godin had a great quote on my podcast he talked about how forward motion is thrilling and thrilling gives you dopamine and so 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 keeping moving forward is great the flip side of that is that even when you're not going backwards you're just standing still it feels like you're going backwards so you constantly yeah. find new ways to move forward however slow that might be that's beneficial uh, that's excellent. So he, he realized that like, hey, I need that hit. I need that dopamine hit. I need that whatever you want to call it to thrill. So I'm going to engineer that into my life. That makes really good sense as part yeah. of the, you know, the moving forward progress, uh, process. Let's talk about the, uh, the adjectivization is the word I'm going to coin here. And I see it a lot in the OCD community where people will use those initials like OCD. Oh, I'm so OCD. I'm so this, I'm so that. I, and I've heard you talk about the difference between ADHD traits and ADHD proper. Uh, is, is that been a well, problem? That's, that's the thing. It's like you lose your key. Oh, I can't find my keys. I'm so ADHD. No, you're just an idiot. Hang them up in the same place every day. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's very easy to, to blame. You know, you'd never say, oh, God, I'm really tired today. God, that's, that's, I must have cancer. You know, you don't do that. Right. So, so it's very easy to blame something in your brain on, on what you are when, in fact, that's not what you are at all. Um, and it does a disservice, I think. It does, it does a disservice to people who actually do have uh, ADD and ADHD because it, it, there is some struggle to it. Um, but being able to sort of understand what you have, um, and, uh, work it to your advantage, you know, I'm proud to say that I have ADHD. Oh, I like it. And why wouldn't you? I mean, what's not, that's just the way you're wired. So maximize it, own it. No. Yeah. 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 And I think this, you know, we could draw a parallel between that and the folks who are dealing with the disorders, you know, that we're that I, I'm addressing in the podcast and in my books, you know, sometimes those traits that led us to those things may have silver linings. So, you know, the, the well, ability- that's the key. The key yeah. is instead of getting upset, find out what they are, figure out where they are. Yeah, yeah, you gotta put the fire out, put the fire out of the disorder first, which is something I always talk about, but then you, you might actually find that some of the stuff that got you into that, that fix in the beginning, and you know, to begin with, could potentially be positive aspects of your personality and your, and your, your living style, your management style, all those things. So nope. there, could be, there could be a silver lining in almost anything, which is really great. Um, Per percentage. So we know that we, we tend to overuse, you know, that those, those letters, ADD, ADHD, I'm so ADD. The percentage is actually relatively small uh, in the population, at least here in the U.S., that has actually been diagnosed, correct? And, but the thing is, it is growing. Okay. It is definitely, the, the, the audience is definitely growing, that the number of people with ADD, ADHD is definitely growing. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a, uh, we're going to see probably 15% of the, of the, of the country uh, in some sort of neurodiversity within yeah. uh, 10 to 15 years. Let's, let's talk about the term neurodiversity for a second. And, I, and I've had Krista Holman, who is, you know, very active in the community. She's the neurodivergent rebel. She was on a, a year ago or so. But I think a lot of people don't understand that term. That was a new term to me, neuro, neurodiversity. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's just the basic concept that our brain, you know, the, the, the normal brain um, and the non-normal brain. So neurodiverse is any term, ADD, ADHD, autism, spectrum, executive function disorder, anything along those lines um, is neurodiverse. You know, your yep. brain operates in a slightly different way which has pluses and minuses. And so uh, the more you understand about them and know how to use them, the better you can do. And the key being that, you know, diversity is not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't make your brain broken. It oh, might not in the be slightest. Right. Yeah. It just, your brain might be different than mine. Okay. Yeah. So what? Some people are taller. Some people are shorter. Some people speak one language or another. Some people can play musical instruments. Some cannot. And so, the, and the, and the, the companies that understand this and welcome those neurodiverse uh, employees are going to be doing so, so much better. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a second, because I know your initial background in PR and marketing, public relations and marketing, and you're a fixture on, on TV and, you know, and just a go-to kind of guy in a lot of those issues. 
but you have spent a lot of your time now starting to educate the corporate world on neurodiversity and what that means in the workplace and how they can address it and leverage it in some cases, yes? The key is that the more you accept that, the more you stop fighting against it, right? Whether, whether you're an employer or whether you're an employee or whether yeah. you're just a regular person, the more you start fighting, stop fighting against it and embrace it, um, the easier it is. You know, it's, it's ridiculously hard to win a battle while going uphill. Going downhill and learning to fight that battle is, is part of your best move. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you take the advantages, run with them. You're almost letting gravity work for you in that situation. Like, and, and is that a matter of not trying to shoehorn your employees, your associates into what you think they should be, but rather recognizing what they actually are and using well, that? Is that a common thread? That's the thing, you know, and it's the problem with schools. Is, and it's not schools, it's not teachers' faults per se. They're doing so much more with so much less. But, you know, if you have 35 kids in a class and two of them are acting a little different than everyone else, you know, you, you tend to want to fix those two. Right, because you can't move 33 others to the other way. But the fact of the matter is that some people need to learn differently. Yeah. And the more we can learn that and the better we do, you know, the better chance we have at, at, at doing well. Hey, I think in the end, you know, if you're going to try and shoehorn the folks that don't fit the mainstream, you're, we're leaving behind a giant portion of our human resources. No question about which it. Which is ridiculously just a huge waste. I of wanted to change resources. the whole world. There's so many few things that you can do, so many little things you can do to really make things, you know, better. I mean, they, they did a study in, um, in, uh, Texas, I think it was, where they took a school district in Texas and they, they gave them 90 minutes of, 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 of um, uh, recess a day versus 30. And they changed yeah. the food the kids were eating from like mostly carbs, to like high protein. Yeah. And they saw ridiculous numbers, like 26% or something of, 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 of uh, less, less outbursts, less ADHD outbursts in boys and something like a 30 something percent increase in girls uh, getting involved in the conversation. The numbers were huge. Wow. That's no joke. Yeah, I, I, and what does that do? That doesn't hurt anyone else. That doesn't, that no, doesn't, no negatives there. No, that, no, that's only a win. And you know, it's so interesting because even as somebody who's outside of that, you know, in that community looking in, that would seem like common sense. So why didn't we do that long ago? Like, <laughs> just well, where's the harm there? It's not so that, uh, you know, things, uh, we don't, we don't change things. Or quote, quote, unquote, that's the way it's always been done. Yeah, yeah, that's the way we always did it. So let's bring it back in the last few minutes before we start to wrap it up, because the topic is always anxiety and anxiety disorders. Has that been an issue for you? Does that come along with, with your particular situation? Has so it's, it ever it, something it, you struggled with? The concept of anxiety and anxiety disorders, as you imagine them to be a person, you know, which is obviously not the case, but a person like sitting in his room, biting his nails and afraid, to, you know, afraid to go outside. Yeah. It's actually never been me. I've been the entire opposite. I, my happy, happiest place is on stage. Yeah. They put me in front of 30,000 people and I'm home, I'm talking and I'm home and that's my keynote. Um, but on the flip side, you know, with ADHD comes tremendous, um, um, I was up way too late watching the results last night, uh, oh. comes tremendous uh, imposter syndrome. Okay. Right? So I sit there and I'm, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time, you know, thinking, well, God, look at that. 30,000 people just gave me a standing ovation. Can't believe how stupid they all are. I can't believe they all bought, you know, that I know what I'm talking about. My God, you know? And so it's, it's, it's this, this premise that um, uh, we, well, I'm not afraid to go on stage and, you know, until I'm told otherwise, I'm totally afraid that whatever I said, no one liked. So there's a lot of imposter syndrome there. And I think it is connected in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, how, do, how do you deal with that? That's a common thread among my, my audience. They're, those are, it's an irrational fear. It's a, it's somewhat intrusive. I know it's not crippling for you because clearly you're still excelling in what you do, which is tremendous. But me, it's how have you learned to deal with that? Like, do you just, can you just recognize that? Oh, that's just me doing that thing that I do again. It's okay. For me, it is understanding that it is irrational and that okay. I do need to let it go. It's yeah. not a big of a deal, you know, and that I can, that I can, uh, you know, stay and focus on uh, what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to get done. Yeah. Right. And, and as long as I, and I go get through it and I'll see it and it'll look great. And that's, you know, that's the key, right? The key. And, so, and, and you know, I ask for the occasional feedback, right? I'll, I'll, uh, after I give a speech, if the CEO or whoever hired me comes over and says, that was amazing. Okay. I can breathe a little bit. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, you, just, you, you, look for, you look for ways. And I think, you know, if you're listening right now, and even if ADHD, ADD isn't an issue for you, I mean, here's a person, Peter's a guy that literally, when he says that he had t dinners scheduled in different continents, because you're traveling the entire world, being asked to speak on your areas of expertise, clearly an accomplished individual with tremendous credentials, who still can be subject to the irrational fear, like, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. They're going to find me at any moment. So, Everybody has those issues. Everybody, every human being sometimes is confronted by those kind of, you know, rational thoughts or things that, that plague us a bit. They just don't have to be crippling. So yep. 
Yeah, great example. I appreciate that. Very inspiring. So let's wrap it up by if somebody suspects, and, and I don't know what, I, I think I know what your answer is going to be here, uh, even before knowing you all that well, but somebody suspects that, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm ADD, ADHD. Um, what's, what should they do? And, and what really would change once the diagnosis is there or not there? I mean, you know, obviously talk to your doctor, find out, uh, you know, medication is not necessarily an, an evil thing. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I'm also not anti-med. Yeah. I believe there's a place for it. I have a prescription. I just, I rarely, t I take it. On I've heard, very, I've heard you say you use it as a tool when you need it. Exactly. Yeah. So the tool is to understand, you know, what works for you, what works for you might be a little different than what works for me. Right. But you know, it, it is, it is really about um, going and figuring out what works for you and then implementing that and not being afraid to try new things. And also not being afraid to understand that, you know, um, uh, it might not work today, but it might work tomorrow, right? Don't just keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a common thread in, re in recovery from the disorders I'm addressing as well. Like yeah. you just got to keep going, got to stick with the program, keep going and it, things, things will get better. Yeah. And I'm guessing that over time you have learned to maximize, you've gotten way better at maximizing and minimizing over time. I'm sure you didn't start out that way. It's practice. No, I don't know. Start that was terrible. <laughs> Trial and error. Yeah. Excellent. I appreciate it so much. How can people find you? Sure. So the podcast is fasterthannormal.com. The book is, you can find the book in anywhere, faster than normal, anywhere you, anywhere you shop the books, Amazon, whatever. Yeah. Um, my life is at, is I'm at Peter Shankman on all the socials and my website is shankman.com. Excellent. I appreciate it. Well, Pete, thanks for coming by, Peter. Thank you for coming by. I appreciate you taking 20 minutes out of your schedule. Uh, you guys, if you're listening, you have questions, post them. I'll see if I can pass them through and uh, if possible uh, and we'll kind of go from there. Maybe we'll do it again one day. I'd love it. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Yeah, you too. Okay. Well, that was all kinds of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to Peter Shankman as much as I enjoyed talking to him. If you'd like to find Peter, his podcast, or his book online, you can go to fasterthannormal.com. It's all right there. As always, I'm going to ask a favor. If you guys are listening on iTunes or some other podcast platform where you can rate and review the podcast and you are enjoying it, take a minute and leave a rating or even write a little review because it helps other people find the podcast. And if it's helping you, maybe you can help them too. So thanks again for stopping by. I'll see you guys next week. And I'll leave you as always with Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake, who you can find at facebook.com slash Ben Drake Music. Amazing musician. Check him out. See you next week. Yeah, you all doing fine. It's all around you. You can breathe it in. And this is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're going to win. Yeah, you all doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast No looking back or dwelling on the past